I am proud to introduce one of Longmont's best known citizens. Vance Brand was born in Longmont, right on Lincoln Street. He attended Central Elementary School and Longmont High School. After graduating from the University of Colorado, he flew fighter jets for the U.S. Marine Corps and then became a test pilot. In 1966, he was accepted into NASA's fifth astronaut class. His long and varied space exploration career includes participating in the first international space mission as command module pilot on the Apollo Soyuz test project. He commanded three space shuttle missions in 1982, 1984, and 1990. Vance Brand's new autobiography, Flying Higher and Faster, will be available for signing after tonight's event. He is here tonight with his wife, Beverly, sons, Dane and Patrick, and daughter-in-law, Kathy. It is truly an honor to have an American hero return to his hometown. Please join me in welcoming Vance Brand. Thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful being here back in Longmont. Uh, before I start, I'd like to uh, have my family wave, family members that are here that uh, Eric just <laughs> mentioned. <laughs> well, when I was uh, growing up, Longmont was really a different place. <laughs> it, it was about 8,000 population, and, uh, but a wonderful place to grow up. I had grandparents out in hygiene, and uh, when I was a little kid, a grandfather on the uh, Longmont City Council. My dad was a local vet. My, uh, my uh, parents, uh, families came over in the early 1900s from uh, various places, uh, father's side from New York and the mother's side from uh, Ohio. And uh, actually, I think uh, when my mother's family first came out, they were in Fort Lepton. It was only about uh, 37 years after the end of the western frontier. Some people say that frontier may still be going, but, uh, but uh, it, it was after 1990 when uh, the, the uh, fighting died down. So uh, we were, I guess what you'd call native Colo Coloradoans, but now uh, I've lived in uh, California for quite a while, so uh, I hope none of that's rubbed off. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to uh, show you a film, but before I do, uh, I'll narrate the film. Before I do, uh, I'd just like to say that uh, I was very lucky in life because uh, had I been born 20 years earlier, uh, my profession di didn't exist, that of astronaut. And uh, of course, uh, now there are astronauts uh, shake a bush and an astronaut falls out. But, uh, <laughs> I was going through the, uh, my uh, old yearbook, graduated from high school here down on Main Street uh, the old high school, in 1949. And it was, uh, I was going through uh, a page uh, of the book that sort of said, what are these people going to do in life? And uh, I read that and I 
I came across my name. It turned out that uh, it said that uh, Bob Akers, who was a classmate, would uh, open a machine shop and uh, he would develop a space engine that didn't require any fuel and it could go to the, go to the planets, which is a great idea. Uh, and, uh, and I was his assistant and another classmate. So uh, at least I got into the space business, but uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't develop any, uh, any uh, great engine or anything like that. But uh, believe it or not, they're talking about space engines now that are similar to what that would have been, that uh, can somehow be fueled by the vacuum of space. And it's it's uh, not a sure thing yet, but uh, maybe in one or 200 years, we'll have marvelous things like that in space. Well, <clears throat> when I left Longmont, uh, went to CU, and from there into the Marine Corps, and uh, I, I really uh, didn't think about flying in my life until I was at Cherry Point, North Carolina, on uh, an early Marine Corps assignment. And uh, jet, engine, uh, jet airplanes, which were fairly new back in the early 50s, were taking off fighter airplanes. And, uh, I thought, man, I've just got to do that. Uh, that I, was, I was very lucky, although I was completely confused about what I wanted to do in life until the age of 22. When uh, I got to that base and I saw those airplanes taken off, I, uh, I just wanted to do that. And from there on, uh, it was going to machines that were high, flying higher and faster, and uh, ultimately uh, space machines, which uh, fly pretty high and, <laughs> and, and go pretty fast. Well, I'm sorry that I won't be around for the next uh, 100 years, because I think marvelous things may happen in the exploration of space. Uh, it all depends up upon the will of the people of this country and of the world. And I think uh, there's a good chance that uh, in uh, the lifetime of some of the children why they will, that are alive now, that they will witness somebody walking on Mars. We're doing marvelous things in space with drones, but uh, the big thing in the future, I think, will be uh, going, taking people into deep space. Well, my, uh, as Eric mentioned, my career in NASA amounted to uh, being in, uh, first in the Apollo program and helping uh, develop that, being on an Apollo backup crew and, uh, but the guy I was backing up didn't break a leg or get the measles, so I didn't get to go to the moon. But uh, I did get, after Apollo Soyuz, the link up with the Russians, or the Soviets as we called them back then, in 1975. I, I uh, flew the, the shuttle and uh, we had three great, Flight, so you'll see some of that in the footage that's uh, coming up now. So if you'd roll the film, I'll talk about it. This is uh, the, Apollo so uh, the Apollo rocket on the pad. And uh, we went out there in the early hours and uh, we were following the launch of this Russian Soyuz. And, uh, so this is Russian footage of the uh, Soyuz lifting off in Kazakhstan in Central Asia. They got on orbit and uh, then we launched seven and a half hours later and took two days catching up with them 
rendezvousing with them. Here, here you see the, uh, some of the really cool liftoff shots, the uh, ice and the, everything breaking off of the rock as it goes into space. We had a good crowd there. Uh, my parents were in that group and uh, quite a few people from Longmont, as a matter of fact. After two and a half minutes, the first stage dropped off, and that's what you see here. And it only took about nine minutes to get into orbit. I forget, it was eight to 10 minutes. And uh, then we, as I said, spent two days catching up and finally rendezvoused and docked with the Russian spacecraft, which is what you see there. This is ours. And uh, that's theirs. It looked sort of like a green bug when I first saw it. It had, <laughs> it, uh, had green colored fabric on the outside and wings. And that's a docking target that was used by Tom Stafford to perform the docking. Very shortly thereafter, they Guys from our side went through an uh, interconnecting module, the docking module, and went into the Soyuz where they signed documents and ate a meal. And I was back uh, minding the store because our spacecraft was uh, really holding attitude for everything that was linked together. So. Uh, I missed this ceremony and got into the Soyuz for four and a half hours later. But uh, this was during the Cold War that many of you may remember. And uh, it was, some people say it was uh, just one of the steps toward uh, trying to end the Cold War and uh, to show some cooperation instead of uh, animosity between the two countries. It, our guys are going into their spacecraft here. And uh, they had pictures on the wall. Alexei Leonov, one of the crewmen on their side, uh, is a good artist, so he he's put sketches on the wall. And there was a lot of ceremony. We ate meals in their spacecraft. They came over into ours and had meals. <clears throat> it was a, uh, and here I'm exercising. <laughs> it's a kind of a rubber bungee exerciser. <laughs> and finally it was time to leave. We. Uh, undocked from them and flew around them doing a, an experiment. We had about five joint experiments with them and uh, another 25 of our own. So there was a lot of science being done on that mission in a, a lot of different areas. Here we are undocking and uh, very shortly you'll see us redock. This was a command and service module. Well, at the end of the mission, uh, they landed in Kazakhstan. And a few days later, we landed out by Hawaii in the ocean. And uh, so we were under three parachutes. There's our splashdown. The, our spacecraft uh, turned over as soon as it hit the water, so we had to ride it again by inflating those big balloons on the top of the spacecraft, and we went aboard a carrier. Uh, the next mission is STS-5. That was in 1982, and it was my first flight in the shuttle. I got to command three shuttle flights, so that was the first one. 
we, our job, uh, well, it was billed as the first operational flight of the shuttle. And we had a crew of four and uh, two telecommunication satellites that would be sent to high Earth orbit about 20 some thousand miles above the Earth. So uh, we were to take them into Earth orbit and uh, then they would have a, a rocket booster that, that was uh, ignited and uh, they would go into orbit. Well, here, here we are uh, during launch. I talked all through launch, but uh, it was somewhat similar to an Apollo launch. And uh, it involved uh, hardware that's uh, made over here in Littleton uh, at uh, McDonnell Douglas, which is Steve Martin. Uh, on the way up into orbit with the shuttle, those solid rocket rockets uh, burn out. There are two of them, and uh, they peel off. And once on orbit, then uh, this is the deployment of uh, one of our satellites. Everything worked very well, and uh, we were just elated by the mission. And that's the satellite going out into the blackness of space. <laughs> at, the, at the end, we, we considered ourselves uh, to be in a delivery service. <laughs> Ace Moving Company. I think Joe Allen came up with that one. And uh, here, here's the, what the cockpit and the shuttle looked like. I was on the left. Bob uh, Overmeyer was co-pilot on the right and got to land at Edwards Air Force Base on their runway. And uh, it was a great mission. You, you, when you go through a mission, uh, there are a lot of steps and you kind of breathe a sigh of relief every time you get by one of the milestones successfully. And here we are coming down, meeting the boss and some of the folks that uh, helped make the mission a success. Interestingly, you're about two inches taller after you come down from space but that only lasts about a day. <laughs> okay, the next is going to be uh, STS-41B, which was a, a flight in Challenger. Challenger and Columbia were both lost, but uh, this was my Challenger flight. And here's liftoff. Once again, beautiful photography of a momentous uh, event. Th there, there's a lot of shake, rattle, and roll. And uh, so it, it's uh, the first time you experience it, it's especially uh, meaningful. Once on orbit, uh, here I am going up a ladder, except you don't need a ladder up there. And uh, we had a lot of spacewalks, EVAs, what we call them. And uh, this is Bruce McCandless, who currently lives up in uh, the mountains west of Denver. Uh, but uh, back then, he helped uh, lot, uh, the uh, contractor uh, develop the MMU, which was a a backpack for flying out into space. He went out, he and Bob Stewart, the first army officer to fly in space, uh, went out 100 yards away from the spacecraft with no ropes attached. They just uh, 
had propulsion in their backpacks. And here's the landing. It was the first landing at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And uh, it's much the same as landing at Edwards. The only thing is the uh, terrain's a little different. And uh, you have to make sure all the uh, alligators and wild pigs are scared off the runway. It had been foggy the night before, and so you see the re residual uh, stream coming off of the, the wingtips, and you see a, a little bit of haziness. But when we landed, it was good. The runway there is three miles long, so you don't have to uh, sweat putting on the brakes uh, too, too early. And uh, my last mission was in 1990, just before the Gulf War. And that was in Colombia again. And uh, this was a night, night flight. So uh, during launch, we got to look around and see that part of Florida that was being lit up by by the rocket blast. We launched uh, fairly late at night and later landed at night too at Edwards. On orbit, always a lot to see, but here we're over ocean. So, uh, and if there are clouds, of course, it's hard to see anything, but most of the time we were over clear areas, it seemed. Capture it, but sunrises and sunsets on orbit are beautiful, multicolored. Here we're opening the payload bay doors so that we can uh, work the telescopes. We had four professional PhD astronomers in the crew, a crew of seven, and uh, so they cranked up the uh, telescope infrared and x-ray telescopes, which, of course, look at a little different sort of light than what we see outside in the daytime. We would generally maneuver on the lit up side of the Earth to, to, so that we we're pointing at a star or galaxy or dust cloud, whatever we wanted to look at. And uh, then they would do their work when we went into the dark side on the dark side of the Earth. Of course, it only took 90 minutes to go around the Earth, and uh, so they had probably 40 minutes or so, uh, at least, to uh, do their science. Now, before we could re-enter and come home, we had to check out the uh, elevons and other systems to make sure that this machine would work right as an airplane as well as a spacecraft. And here we are doing that. And uh, my hair's a little out of control there. <laughs> <laughs> In weightlessness, uh, it, you need to put some, something on it. And we landed uh, at Edwards at night, about 10 o'clock at night. And here we are rolling out. Uh, this picture was taken with a infrared uh, film, so you can see the light parts of the vehicle are still hot. We came down, met, met the boss as usual, and, uh, and that was about it. We had briefings after that, and uh, that was my last uh, flight into space. <laughs> well, the space program, uh, when 
when I was a kid, there wasn't a space program. Nobody had gone into space. Uh, it was before Sputnik. And uh, so, as I said, I was really lucky to uh, go onto the space program. And I was in the right age bracket. My father's age would not have qualified him. And, and even now, it's a little bit hard to get into space, but it, it's going to improve, I think, uh, especially with the uh, commercialization of space starting up now. The government will still do things in, in Earth orbit, but uh, it's, it's uh, eventually we'll, I think we'll have quite a few people up there. And uh, I'm uh, sorry that I can't live for another hundred years because uh, well, I think some, somebody from Earth will be walking on Mars. Uh, maybe in, uh, I don't know how many years, but uh, it all depends on the people. I think uh, we can develop the wherewithal to do it, and uh, people, it's a matter of the people wanting to do it like they did with Apollo. I remember thinking in Apollo that uh, it's so difficult, I don't know how this program of getting to the moon can succeed, but uh, it worked. They succeeded, and uh, there was a lot of risk involved. It was not risk-free. Uh, as you know, they had Apollo 13, an accident up there, but recovered the crew okay. I think in the future, there will always be risks in space, just like there are in flying airplanes or even driving cars. But maybe the, the, that will all get a little better with time. I'm, I'm sure it will. So with that, uh, I'd just like to say that I felt very fortunate to have been uh, raised in Longmont. It was a great town when I was growing up. And I'm happy to see that it's evolving into, uh, well, it's 10 times bigger now, or maybe 12 times bigger, but uh, it's kept pace with the times. It's transitioned from a small farming town into, uh, well, a very industrial, uh, modern sort of uh, scene these days. And I'm not up on all the space industry you have around here, but I know that Longmont, Broomfield, and Boulder have an awful lot. And uh, we read about them uh, in the news every now and then. So uh, with, with that, I'd like to, uh, before I stop, uh, just say that I'm really glad my family, uh, some of my family members were able to come here for this. Uh, two sons, uh, daughter-in-law, uh, wife, and uh, so this has been a, a happy, happy thing for me. Uh, with that, let's go into questions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, before we start with questions, um, <laughs> so uh, we have one announcement, and then the way the questions are going to work is if someone will say the question and then I will repeat it into the microphone. Um, but I think first we have an announcement. We do. So uh, there's a green car. They didn't tell me what kind. It's green, though. In the parking lot, the license plate is QJL179. Your lights are blinking and your alarm is going off. If that's your car, you might want to go check it out. Um, so Eric's going to take the front of the room. I'm going to help out back here in the back. So why don't we go ahead and get started with questions. All right, so Ellen, you had a question? I always have a question. Uh, do you think there is life of some sort on other planets? So the question is, do you think there is life on other planets? OK. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a specialist in this area, so this is just my opinion. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, 
There are so many galaxies out there and so many stars in each galaxy that I, I think it would be uh, almost presumptive of, of, of us to assume that there isn't life out there somewhere. Uh, but uh, on other planets, I believe you mentioned. Well, I think there's a pretty good chance that there will be life underground in Mars. The surface of Mars is uh, flooded with uh, intense sunlight with uh, no thick atmosphere to filter it. So uh, we may not ever see anything on the surface, but go down six feet or 10 feet, uh, I, w I would, uh, wouldn't be at all surprised, but we'll find life there. Also, there are two moons, a mo uh, Enceladus and uh, uh, Europa, uh, mo moons of uh, Jupiter and, uh, and Saturn that have th their icy moons. But underneath the ice are big oceans. And uh, there are a lot of people thinking that there will be life underneath that ice in the oceans. Uh, so we'll, we'll all, f well, somebody will know someday. Because uh, uh, science keeps marching on. And uh, I think we have missions that are, uh, going up to explore those moons. Uh, and we're doing a lot on Mars these days. You know, we've had several successful Mars robots. And uh, so we're learning a lot about Mars. So answers, my opinion, yes. All right. How about one from the back half? Uh, way up here in the very back. What's your question? The question was, what did you have to eat when you visited the Russian capsule, and what did they eat when they visited you? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'll start with the last part. We, <clears throat> we had all uh, a big variety of uh, types of food on our spacecraft. We had a lot of freeze-dried stuff. All you had to do was add hot or cold water to it, and uh, you could come up with uh, everything but no leafy salads or anything like that. Uh, we also had military rations, and uh, for some of the later shuttle missions, we had fresh fruit. We had uh, apples and oranges and things like that. On my last mission, uh, that all that was very tasty and it went very well for about three or four days. And then <clears throat> the stuff started to rot. <laughs> and uh, it smelled so bad that we had to put it in a sealed bag and take it back to Earth. But now the last, the, the other first part of the question, when we went into their spacecraft, they had a lot of foods that they were still eating out of uh, tubes, tubes like toothpaste tubes. Uh, they had uh, fish and borscht, which is a beet soup, and uh, things that most of us aren't too familiar with, but which in our training before the mission we'd learned a little bit about, so uh, their food was good too. Um. Yes, the young woman. Um, can you tell us about your helicopter flying? So the question is about your helicopter flying. Oh, well, I have uh, 400 hours in, uh, in uh, one of the early helicopters. Uh, at, the, at the time, everybody in the Apollo program, which I was a part of, was getting to fly, learn to fly helicopters because we thought that uh, the skills would transfer uh, over to landing the, the lunar vehicle. And uh, so, yeah, I have uh, 
those 400 hours, I really enjoyed flying the helicopter. It, uh, it's different, but uh, it was fun. Okay, another one from the back. How about this gentleman right here? So the question was, which ride was best, the Apollo or the shuttle, and which was your favorite, correct? <laughs> okay, the smoothest. I'm, I'm going to cheat on this answer. <clears throat> I, uh, if I was going to the moon or into deep space, the shuttle wouldn't work, and uh, the Apollo was a great vehicle. It had a computer back in those early days. And uh, you, you could do things with it, that, some things that you couldn't do with the shuttle. If I were to be in Earth orbit, I liked the shuttle because you had wall-to-wall -wall windows. You could see out a lot. You could, uh, if you were coming up on something like Gibraltar or Dakar or Cairo, uh, somebody in the spacecraft would say, hey, I see Cairo. And then uh, everybody would break away for a, a couple of minutes there and just look going over it. And uh, so the other thing about the shuttle, the shuttle was like flying an airplane, especially when you land. It, uh, so I like that better than plopping down in the ocean under a parachute. <laughs> I guess. Um, yes, right here. If you could go back to space, would you do it again? Would I do it again? Uh, well, I couldn't pass the physical now. <laughs> but uh, if... Uh, I, I certainly would if... Uh, if I could pass the physical. And uh, I, I thought each space flight was a challenge and uh, I, I enjoyed the flight and the challenge. So I would, yeah. Back. But not to Mars. <laughs> I, I wouldn't make it that. I, I would, would have gone to Mars 20 or 30 years ago, but not now. All right, right back here in the very back. What's your question? This young lady would like to know how many spacecrafts you have been in. Uh, I guess it's uh, four. Uh, one Apollo and uh, three shuttles. Uh, well, if you say spacecraft, uh, it's two shuttles, because I only flew Challenger in Columbia. And... Uh, so then if you add in Apollo Soyuz, that makes it uh, three. So we've probably got time for about two more questions. <laughs> All right, over there, yeah, young man. <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat it? <laughs> ah, very good question. What milestone would you like humanity to achieve? Say that one again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, looking ahead, well, what do you think are some of the next milestones that humanity is going to achieve in space? Oh, sky's the limit. We can't dream of everything yet. But uh, we're... Uh, making such great strides right now in so many areas. Uh, and so we can't even imagine what it's going to be, but I think going out into deep space more with people will be one of them. And uh, the other thing is, I don't know if anybody's noticed, but we completely rely on satellites and other things we have in uh, Earth orbit now. Uh, we have, uh, it's just as if, if they took away the internet, we'd be in trouble. And if they took away Earth orbit uh, vehicles and satellites and stuff, 
we'd be in trouble there too. So the real answer is I can't even imagine the things that are going to happen because I get surprised about every 10 years when something comes up that I had never dreamt of, like 3D manufacturing. Uh, that's a good example. Who would have thunk it? <laughs> and it looks like time for one more question from the back. Yeah. Okay, and your question? Uh, she says, hi, I am deaf. Can, deaf. can a deaf adult be an os astronaut? She would like to know if a deaf adult could become an astronaut, someone who had a hearing impairment. Uh, not yet. Uh, maybe in, in uh, 50 or 100 years, who knows. Uh, but uh, right now, the requirements become uh, an astronaut be it in commercial or uh, military or, or uh, civilian uh, government like NASA is uh, the requirements are pretty high. But uh, I think that'll change. Uh, right now, we have mostly engineers and uh, people like that that uh, scientists that are in orbit doing their thing. But in time, we may have poets and, uh, and uh, people of various uh, persuasions uh, up in space. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, I, I mentioned my family, but I'd also like to have uh, somebody stand up that I went to, uh, to Longmont, that was in my class at Longmont High School. Class of 49, the 49ers, uh, Dean Bull, I think. <laughs> uh, and we have some uh, farmland near Longmont and <clears throat> so, uh, the people that are renting that farmland from us are uh, Arnold and, and Pat Turner. So uh, wherever they are, there we go. <laughs> well, it's a great future. All I can say it to the young people here is, if you think you're interested in uh, space, Study hard, don't get into trouble, and, uh, and uh, if you set your heart on something, well, it gives you the best chance of making it. So I hope we'll have a lot of young people in uh, the space program tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and thanks uh, for, for the honors of the flag ceremony at the beginning. That was great. Okay. So the book signing will begin in a few moments. Once we are set up, it will be out in the atrium. this way. <laughs>